This is the 007 Debriefings. I'm Intelligence Officer Wiz. And I'm Weapon Specialist Zero. Zero, how are you doing today? A little bored. My day job, the client dropped on the deadline. Mm. They were supposed to turn in something to my employer side today, but they did not. Oh boy. <laughs> so I got to sit on my hands all day waiting and waiting and waiting. And then right when I was about to clock out, it was just a, hey, um, we got anything? Nope. All right, fuck this. I'm leaving. <laughs> We are here to comb the files of MI6 to talk about the cinematic exploits of one James Bond. This week, Die Another Day. Zero, I have one question to ask you. Is Die Another Day the 9-11 of James Bond? Oh, God, not even 9-11. It's worse. <laughs> I would say bona fide <laughs> trash fire. Oh, God. <laughs> I guess a little preview of what our review is going to be. I mean, we, we've been talking about this throughout the entire time we've been doing this. This is long considered to many people to be the worst Bond movie, and we're probably going to get into why that is. But I think we all went into this going, oh, this is going to be bad. I am still kind of surprised by some of the things that are bad in this movie. So here are the mission objectives for Die Another Day. We're going to go through certain elements of the Bond film, discuss the film in totality. So let's start with the first mission objective, which is 007, James Bond played by Pierce Brosnan. God, this one starts off kind of in a bit of an interesting dynamic. Bond doesn't quite get the job done and gets captured. Then you've got like just scenes of him being just completely tortured to hell and back. Right after that, M just kind of says, hey, you fucked up. You leaked. So we're putting you on ice because we got to find out how bad you started spilling secrets. And just right from the get go, it starts off pretty good. Um, you've got Bond going rogue. It's just like, oh, shit, he's on his own. Wow. OK, interesting start. And then things turn around. He gets double O status. He gets all the gadget and gizmo support from John Cleese's Q, as usual. And then just kind of coasts on his performance, in my opinion. So if you'd like him on the action stuff, I mean, he's plenty serviceable. So, I mean, you'll probably have fun with him on the action stuff. But I don't know, just the acting overall for Brosnan just felt really weak in this one. You know why it's probably weak? Because it's very inconsistent. Like you mentioned that in the beginning he was tortured and he goes rogue, which in my mind would be, oh, wow, go full Dalton, just like he did in License to Kill. That would be interesting to see him do that. But it doesn't go that route, does it? Because then it goes into Dalton to then suddenly he's more... Uh, of a Roger Moore-ish type of Bond, which in both circumstances just doesn't work well with Brosnan in this movie. And I agree with the action, he's serviceable, but it just is incredibly inconsistent in this movie. What was Brosnan trying to do in this one, uh, specifically to make it work? And I think the big weakness of Brosnan is going to be the fact that he never made Bond into something different that was molded to him. You know, bringing up the inconsistency, I think that was probably the missing equation I was looking for. You've got Dalton in the beginning, and then it just becomes kind of a forgettable mishmash towards the end. Mm -hmm. I think if you take away Lazenby, I think he's the worst Bond. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just especially now with sort of looking at the bigger picture. Yes. It's just like, wow, holy cow, just Brosnan's actually kind of a terrible Bond. <laughs> Yeah, and I think a lot of people might point that out to us, too. It's like, well, you've just been watching every Bond film once a week. That's probably why you feel that way. And if you're not that serious about it, I think Brosnan's fine. But when you take in consideration all the other Bonds, the rest of them, including the one we're about to see, which is going to be Craig, are very distinct and very different reasons that make them interesting and add something to Bond as a character. And he doesn't do it at all in these four movies. Now, GoldenEye was fine. I thought GoldenEye was fun. We have to point out that I think Brosnan, comparatively weak Bond compared to the rest of them. I would even say he's weak compared to Lazenby. But I, again, can't really do a fair comparison because Lazenby only had one shot at it. So let's get into the villain. There's actual multiple villains, and we'll get into one of them at another point. 
But I think there's really one worth talking about, and that's Sir Gustav Graves, played by Toby Stevens. Graves has a bit of an interesting situation going on, especially since it's not as clear as it seems because you've got the intro sequence that happens where Bond ends up killing a North Korean general's son in the initial setup. The son is presumed dead. And at that point, it's just like, okay, you know, I guess now Bond is trying to find out the inside person who leaked the stuff and ended up getting his mission compromised. He gets into some wacky plot stuff, and suddenly you see Gustav Graves speaking Korean. (laughs) Yeah. It's one of those situations that if it didn't get into the weird sci-fi weeds, and when I say sci-fi, we're talking like sci-fi in cartoonish proportions, unfortunately. Yeah, we're talking about face-off, essentially. Face-off, but like mad scientist-y fucking weirdness. Mm -hmm. I think if they somehow found a way to just make the story that had Gustav Graves as a villain, he could potentially be interesting, but... Just with the whole sci-fi bad scientist angle that they're going with, it's just like, oh, what a fucking mess. There's a number of issues with this villain on top of what you just said. First off, you don't meet him as the principal villain until 50 minutes in. The other is how he's introduced. He's introduced by parachuting into Westminster Abbey. You know those type of corporate executive people who are fake it till you make it people? Who's like, eh, I have no time to sleep. I'll sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> like that guy. I can't fucking stand those guys. And he has the most (laughs) punchable face that I have ever seen. In a number of ways, he is just bad. I think the worst thing I can say about Steven's performance in this movie is who it reminded me of. It reminded me of Christopher Walken in A View to Kill. Like, almost to a T. Almost to a T. Because it had the same exact overacting, the same exact sneering. Honestly, the only thing that makes him better than Christopher Walken is that he's not in the film as much. That's it. That was it. So let's get into Bond Girl Zero. And the first one is Jinx Johnson, played by Halle Berry. I quite like Halle Berry a lot. Mm -hmm. I think she's cute. (laughs) She's okay in the role, uh, kind of like a crafty spy type of character and everything. She's got a bit of a humorous element as far as Bond girls go, because she always has the clever getaways and things like that. And then she ends up just getting captured. And then it's just kind of a damsel in distress moment for a little bit. And then after that, they give her some action stuff to do towards the end of the movie. When she gets captured, it almost just kind of seems shoehorned in. I don't know if yeah. if you may have felt that way. It just, just is like, okay, well, Jinx is very, very capable. She's very, very clever as a spy. Through the most of the movie has usually been very tidy to make sure that she does not leave a trace and doesn't make it easy to, for others to find her. For her to suddenly get captured twice over two sequences is a little bit weird, but it's just kind of like, whatever, I guess I'm going to try to disconnect my brain and, you know, just try to enjoy the movie as it is. I agree with you. That was weird. I also do want to say right before I start, I think if there's one thing the bras and era did really well in these four movies is Bond Girls. I I think they did a fantastic job not only finding really good actresses to play these Bond Girls, but I think they're a lot more interesting than the past. I give credit to that. I think they do a great job with the Bond Girls. And I agree with you. I like Halle Berry. I actually really like her in this role. There is one thing that just blew my mind when I was watching this, and it's that she's practically Bond. She's like a one-to-one copy. She is essentially a female Bond. I almost got to a point where I'm like, oh, they were very obviously trying to spin this girl off. It it just seemed to me in this movie that this seemed like a backdoor spinoff to making Jinx her own film franchise. Think about it. Like, she has some of the cooler stunts. She has some of the better sequences. She has her own M, by the way, who is played by Michael Madsen. Since when did we get a, another agent or a, a Bond girl that has her own handler in, in one of these movies? I don't think we have. And, and if we had, they were very much background characters, but they prominently showed Michael Madsen throughout the entire movie. Honestly, I, I wouldn't have thought that would been a bad idea because this is a very good character. The problem also is that she's not in like an act of the film. She's like gone after a certain point and then comes back once it goes to the ice castle sequence. I will definitely agree with you that the Brosnan era Bond girls have been just so, so interesting. Mm -hmm. Some of them are very capable. Some of them have an interesting dynamic that just unfortunately just falls apart at the end. It's just so, so very interesting that you have Jinx uh, as kind of like a actual spy character and 
the more that I think on the whole spinoff idea, it definitely seems like that they were trying to set something up in case of, you know, just maybe we can kind of double dip in the spy action movies and, you know, just make some Bond stuff and have Jinx get spun off on her own thing. Maybe we have a lineage of female spies that are very much Bond girl inspired. I guess something happened that they decided to kind of back out of the idea. <laughs> Keep in mind, if for any listeners, this, this is me just having fun and being sarcastic, but the end sequence with Bond and Jinx humping around in a Buddhist temple, sacrilege. Absolute blasphemy. <laughs> oh, that's a, bad, that's a bad thing? I mean, it'd be like humping around in a church, so... <laughs> so let's get into the other Bond girl, which is Miranda Frost, played by Rosamund Pike. She plays the cold calculating woman role pretty well. She's very aloof, does not care for Bond's antics and stuff like that. Eventually, Bond does kind of work his bravado on her. It seems implied during a later sequence where she ends up syncing up with Graves that Bond thinks that he kind of ended up making her another conquest, but Graves ends up kind of pulling the rug on him going, I mean, psych, I told her to do that. And I was just like, okay. wow, um, one way to pull the rug on Bond there. <laughs> The sword fight sequence at the end, kind of cheesecakey. just she's got sort of like this workout top and like sweatpants oh, yeah. thing. Oh, I was yeah. just like, okay, just, oh yeah. Uh, now you're just laying on the cheesecake, guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Tight sports bra, I can go for it. That's cool. <laughs> I liked it. I was like, the big piece with Frost is just with her playing the role of a undercover MI6 agent and eventually revealing herself to be a double agent while also being very, very cold and calculating. She plays the role well. She doesn't really appear until like the second half of the movie. Mm -hmm. And even then, it's just kind of her being peppered in certain scenes. I think she is done so sloppily. I like Rosamund Pike. I think she's a good actress. She was very good in Gone Girl. I even liked I Care a lot, even though I didn't like the movie very much. The character itself is just so sloppy. Like you mentioned, she's first introduced as a secretary. And then in a very sloppy way, they say, oh, actually, she's an MI6 agent. Oh, okay, cool, I guess. Like, that's some interesting depth. And then once you realize that, oh, and she turned on Bond. I'm like, what? Hold on a second. You're pulling the same thing from the world is not enough, but you're doing it in 15 minutes? Really? That's what we're doing here? Okay, fine. Here's my thought on Miranda Frost. I think, in all honesty, she was only there for an end sequence fight with Jinx. That's it. Bond needs someone that he needs to face off with at the end. And if Jinx is that one-to-one -one Bond, she needs one too. That's a disservice to Pike, who actually is, a, again, a very good actress. With the whole role change just happening so rapidly, it's just so rapid. It almost kind of gives the viewer whiplash because it's just like, wait, hold on a second. She's Graves' secretary before, but now, surprise, she's MI6, huh? Mm. And then, of course, like, just... A little bit after that. Oh, surprise! She's been a double agent all along. She betrayed Bond in the beginning, too. Wow, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Moving on to spy action. This movie has a little bit more spy sequency sort of stuff, especially when Bond starts to sort of investigate the puzzle pieces and everything. Mm -hmm. Especially with the beginning, where just he tries to escape out of the hospital on the ship. Just him using sort of his clever wits and basically reducing his heart rate to make it seem like he's got cardiac arrest, even though that's kind of sci-fi, maybe a little bit out of the realm of actual realism, and then just sort of escapes the uh, Navy hospital ship and then gets to the hotel and, again, just kind of using his instincts. And he's like, I'm being spied on, aren't I? And then just breaking the mirror on the door and just, just you seeing a camera through and you're just like, ah, oh, shit. All right, you know, just kind of using the spy instincts. Kind of cool. It's just really neat to sort of see him sort of use his instincts as an agent and everything to kind of get the job done. And I thought it was great. And then once he gets his double O status reinstated, it's just, all right, here are your I win gadgets. <laughs> yeah, oh, God. <laughs> A car that turns invisible. I mean, <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, okay, you guys are just going the sci-fi cartoon angle with like the gadgets and what they can do. All right. This is my sign to check my brain the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. Or like a watch that can break bulletproof glass. I think this is a huge step down. I mean, we had improvements in action in all three of the pros and eras. And this overall, I think, was just a disaster. I have to point out that I think that direction this film is awful in a in number of sequences one is the incessant need for bad cgi or really dumb camera tricks why is there so much slowdown in this movie why is there fuzzy cam in this movie or fuzzy shots 
And my my the one thing I have, what about those camera moves where it was like a '90s hip hop music video? Why is all this there? They add nothing to the action. And then when we get to CGI as well, some of them are pretty bad because they're utterly ridiculous. Need I remind you of the surfing in the tsunami? I remember that sequence, and I remember it being a bad. I didn't remember being it this bad. Holy oh yeah, just holy cow. The projection screen effect, it was so bad and so corny looking. I was just like, okay, I know that there have been projection tricks in some of the Brosnan era movies too, mm -hmm. but holy shit, this one just looks like it was done by a team that was unexperienced on how to make this look seamless and natural. You don't even have to concentrate that hard, honestly. You just kind of look at it and you're just like, yeah, that doesn't seem right. And then when you look into it, it just looks like Bond is just sort of parachute surfing with a green screen right behind. <laughs> yeah, that's not the only sequence that has bad green screen as well. You could see driving sequences in this movie where you're looking at it and go, this is very obviously green screen. It is so odd. I'm going to squarely put this on Lee Tamahari, who, who directed this film. It is just ugly in a lot of ways. And the choices that he made to slow down the action, to make it more dramatic, utterly pointless. I think this is probably some of the worst action I've seen in the Bond film. Some of the most egregious stuff is just the camera work, like you mentioned, just the weird slowdown effect, the weird fuzzy cam effects. And I know it was the trend at the time because you, know, you had movies like The Matrix doing really weird, fancy camera tricks and stuff like that. But right. this just looked like it was so shoehorned in, like, hey, what do people like? Fancy camera tricks. Shove the whole boatload and they'll love it. Just do it and put a bow on it. It's just like, God, why? No, this that's, this movie is not The Matrix. Stop. That's exactly what it feels like, too. It, it really feels like they just said, well, the kids like it, so why not? All right, so let's get into theme song and opening credits. The theme song is Die Another Day, written by Madonna, Michelle, Columbia. Uh, oh, my God. And Mirwas Hamazal. I, I butchered that guy's name. I'm so sorry. Performed by Madonna. It's a poppy Madonna tune. It's kind of catchy, like most of Madonna stuff is, but uh, kind of just Madonna. But at the same time, it's also kind of forgettable, too, because <laughs> I had forgotten the song until it started playing in the beginning. I was just like, oh, right, this overplayed Madonna song. I remember um, this particular song being overplayed to hell and back on the radio when the movie came out the song wasn't that great but it's got the usual signs of a madonna styled song just very poppy and kind of catchy but just didn't really feel like it had much substance the intro sequence was kind of interesting but usually for most of the bond movie intros it's just kind of a completely stylized intro there's nothing really plot relevant that's happening but this one they kind of blend in the scenes of Bond being tortured in the uh, North Korean prison on top of just the usual fancy CGI sort of openings of a Bond movie with models and stuff dancing around and everything. Mm. So, I mean, visually it was kind of interesting seeing them sort of throw in sort of a plot element to it, but... Yeah, just that's kind of my thoughts on the intro. <laughs> this was utter pain for me. Like, I could not believe what I was watching and listening to. And a part <laughs> of me wanted to mute this while the sequence is going in. But then I was so blown away by, like you said, that in between hearing, another like, and then it's Bond getting the shit kicked out of him and torture. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> it's like, you have this really poppy, annoying techno song, which I'm going to be honest with you. The first thing I thought in my head when I heard this was, why do they hire some knockoff Madonna to do this shit? And then as soon as I saw Die Another Day by Madonna, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and then to use this really upbeat, up-tempo, filled with techno song, with him getting the shit kicked out of him and being tortured, was like, why? <laughs> like, what was the point of this? Like, I don't, I don't understand it. Like, the rest of the Bond ones are like, you know, uh, sexy ladies shooting guns. And they don't make sense, but, like, they, they invoke a mood. I, I don't understand why they decided in this one, well, why don't we just have him being tortured while you listen to Madonna? Oh, I know why. Because it's torture listening to this song. And you want to feel the pain that Bond had. I see now. I just thought of that right now. 
Is, is that what it is? <laughs> I would not doubt it, but no. yeah, just just kind of one of those things. It's just like, all right, it's kind of a neat and pop opportunist sort of thing, but it's also kind of forgettable in the same sort of stroke. But I think part of why I remember the song so often was, good lord, that song was overplayed to shit on the radio uh, when the movie came out, because every single radio station in my local area is just like, we're going to be playing the new Bond theme song. It was like, God, no, stop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Zero, conclusion time. Go right ahead. This one is just an overwhelming mission failure. Oh, just, yeah, mission failure for me too. Good Lord. I mean, between just Bond's inconsistent performance, the weirdness on the action sequence, that sort of stuff, Jinx sort of having to be scripted to be sloppy and being caught so she ends up having to be saved by bond when she's proven through most of the movie that she's a very capable spy then you have emma frost with just her roles being just kind of swapped like crazy and like you said it's not even done elegantly or well it's just kind of a hey by the way did you know she's this oh psych she's this it's just like guys <laughs> and then that's not even to say with the whole issue of the plot behind the villain, I mean, you've got the villain who ends up being presumed dead, but it turned out that he was actually in some sort of gene therapy clinic to remold his face and his personality from a North Korean guy to like a British millionaire. It was just the most crazy sort of sci-fi sort of thing. I'm just like, you know, most Bond movies are kind of grounded in reality and yeah. with the technology of the time. And now you're going into future tech where you've got this villain who went through gene therapy to change his face and his race. And apparently the whole gene therapy process is so fucked up that he's got to be in some sort of freaky chair with like a RGB lit up mask that's called a dream machine. <laughs> it's just like, okay, you guys have just gone on the deep end with this one. To be fair, you want that mask, don't you? You love RGB. <laughs> Um, as a PC gamer, yes, I do love yeah, RGB, yeah. but, oh, God, to say that that somehow keeps you sane because the gene therapy has completely fucked your mind. I was going to give the sci-fi stuff a chance, but you've just gone fully off the deep end. I just have to unplug my brain. <laughs> yeah. uh, for a final Brosnan film, it's just bad. This is absolutely awful. I mean, going into this, I wasn't thinking, will it be good? It was going to be, how bad is this really? And this is really, really bad. My question for you, Zier, before I get into my opinion, is this. Is this the worst Bond film? Personally, I would say it definitely ranks up in the top. Easily top three. <laughs> okay. I am going to say no. I don't think it's the worst Bond film. I think A View to a Kill is the worst Bond film. And the only reason why I am going to say A View to a Kill is worse is because there is actually a character I like in Die Another Day, and that's Jinx. And Halle Berry herself is very good in this movie. And she's actually entertaining when she's on. But in this movie, Jinx is the only thing that's good. And because it's part of the movie, I, I can't call it the worst. But you're right. It is an utter disaster of a film. It is a laughing stock. A lot of decisions, I think, lay upon the director, which is Lee Tamahari. I think he just did a miserable job in this movie. I don't remember M being so incompetent. <laughs> we, we talked about this in The World Is Not Enough, how they really screwed that character by getting her fooled. She got fooled again in this movie. Does Judy Dench's M just suck? What happened? <laughs> Yeah, it's just kind of terrible. It's just like, like this is sort of amateur stuff. You should be able to know whether or not you've got like a double agent kind of sitting under your nose and everything. And, you know, just somehow you're once again fooled. That's not really a good quality to have in a spy master when you failed to catch sort of a major situation twice. It, it makes her seem generally incompetent, which I find stunning because I think this is probably the best actor they'll have playing M. I even like Ray Fiennes, but I think Judy Dench is a better actor. Overall, man, yeah, this is a, a mission failure and a spectacular one at that. Overall, mission failure? Mission failure. Mission failure for Die Another Day, and that's not a surprise. Now, if you want my full review on this movie, you can go to my website at, at IamTheWiz.com. You'll have my full written review right on the site, along with a link 
to the video that has this review that you've just listened to. All right, Zero. So we are at the end of this edition of the 007 Debriefings. Let's get into what's going to be our next one. So what is the next one for next week? It is 2006's Casino Royale oh, with yeah. the debut of Daniel Craig. That's right. Casino Royale. With the exception of Harry Potter, I have never seen a film franchise go from so low to so high within the next film. This one was so interesting because just when I'd heard all the preview buzz and it was just like, yeah, you know, Casino Royale, it's going to go for a approach that's much more faithful to the novels. And it was kind of like one of those moments I was just like, I was interested, but now you have my full attention. <laughs> when they had announced Daniel Craig was playing, I was like, okay, you know, he's got sort of the, uh, the brutal fatalist look. Okay. That's good. That's promising. This is going to sound vain, but it's also kind of funny in retrospect. There was some interview, I forget with with which entertainment outlet, but during the filming process of the movie, uh, they were trying to set up uh, the car chase sequences and everything. And apparently Daniel Craig had never driven a car with a manual transmission ever. That sort of worried me. I was just like, Bond has always come off as a guy who appreciates sports cars, wants the most visceral experience in a sports car possible. You have a primary Bond actor that has never driven one. Oh God, please don't tell me they're going to take the easy way out and go, hey, this car has an automatic transmission and oh, the automatic transmission is a magic gadget. <laughs> Thankfully, another outlet had ended up saying that he ended up taking stunt driving lessons and ended up actually learning how to drive a manual transmission. I was just like, okay, that's actually kind of awesome. <laughs> Tune in next time where we review Casino Royale. I am the Wiz. And I'm Zero. Talk to you guys next time. Bye. <laughs>